Mike Bond here with the newest member of the Bellator roster, Sarah McMahon. Uh, Sarah, I guess congratulations, first of all, on the big news. Um, I guess your initial reaction, how long has this been in the works? Uh, so it's actually been in the works uh, for a really long time. Um, just because um, my manager asked me if I if I was thinking about free, you know, wanting to fight to free agency um, before my Carol Hosa fight. And just being at a different point in my career, I thought, you know, I want to know what's out there. I want to know if the fighters who were saying, oh, I make more money, oh, I'm making killer sponsorship. And I want to know if all those things are real and true. And if you could just like, you know, fight for another high quality promotion and do really, really well. And I'm really, really happy to say that that's the case. That's awesome. So yeah, can you just like walk us through exactly uh, how the UFC departure yeah. went? You obviously had the two scheduled fights with Aspen. Uh, we know what happened yes. there with her withdrawal and then the missing weight. And then, uh, you know, you decide not to fight her on that second one after she had missed weight. So what happened there? Like, did the UFC let you go of that fight of your contract? Did they pay you out and you were able to go? How that ex worked exactly? So um, they, they could have said we're going to keep you and you're going to fight one more and fight out your contract or, but they said, we're going to pay you. Like, they actually took extremely good care of me. And so I'm, I'm always thankful to them and, and how they treated me the whole time I was there. Um, they paid me my fight purse and my win purse. And so that being the, the last one on my contract, um, they let me go to free agency with, a really really like they didn't have to do that they actually didn't i think legally didn't have to pay me anything so um they were really awesome about that uh and so i just and i don't i don't feel bad uh trying to see if there's better options out there you know i think that you have to separate some of your personal feelings of like you know friendships you developed over 10 years or almost 10 years and and really liking people and but making the right decisions for your career. Um, I think that a lot of sport, you know, a lot of people in sports have to do that. Um, you know, baseball teams, football teams, uh, you have to look and see what is offering the best contract and you have to make that decision um, with your brain, not your heart. So while I still like, I'm really thankful for my time in the UFC, um, I wanted to see if there was, really, really good options uh, in the other promotions. Yeah, and that's the smart way to do it, of course. You got to uh, look out for number one. So I guess before we move on from the UFC chapter, almost nine years there in total from the debut, uh, when you look back at that chapter, I know it's still kind of fresh, but like what stands out is maybe your favorite moment or your favorite fight or things along that line. Uh, I So I'd have to say my debut just because it was just – you, there was so much nerves um, and it was just, I had never fought for like such a big promotion on a big stage. And the, that first win was just very euphoric. So it was just like, I don't know. It was just a special moment. My first fight in the UFC. Any regrets? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, the only time I, I regret anything, I don't regret any of my losses except um, when I fought, when I was very compromised and I should have not fought and I ended up losing and it was a, I should have known better. I'd been around athletics enough to know that I was just not going to be able to go out there and perform well. Um, and I, I just, it's a bummer. I, even if I'd won, I would have won not a good fight. <laughs> so, right. yeah, in fairness. So, um, you, you signed with Bellator. I mean, was this a an easy one track decision? Was there other organizations out there trying to get you to come in? Like, how is this uh, process and kind of the transition and finding a new home? So for me, I left everything up to my manager. I just trusted her. So I just had her. She just contacted whoever she thought was like good, viable options, um, and that would be options like pretty quickly. And you know, she gauged the interest. She gauged you know, what people were offering. And then she bought, brought back stuff to me, but only the ones that were like, uh, what she felt were really good offers. Um, but in my heart, I think that Bellator was the one that I, I, I was leaning towards no matter what, just because if I was going to go um, outside of bantamweight, I just feel like it has like 
the most premier promotion for uh, featherweight. And so you are more of a true world champion. So it was for me, I knew where I wanted, but it, you know, if Bellator had, you know, not offered the money that they did, then I would have been like, ah, maybe I should reconsider and make smart choices for my family. But thankfully, like the place I wanted to be and the, they, you know, wanted to offer me really great money as well. So it like, really worked out. That's awesome. Yeah. And your manager, you're referencing Jennifer Goldstein, one of my favorite people in the industry, one of the best managers in the game. So I'm sure she <laughs> took very good care of you in that regard. Um, any idea when you may debut? Has there been any discussions on that? When do you want to fight? I know, you know, you've had the two canceled fights, so I'm sure you're itching to compete. Oh, yes. I definitely <laughs> want to fight soon. I do. But I also respect that before I signed with this promotion, they had their cards already, you know, set out. So mm -hmm. they... Uh, so I'm hoping I, I would love to fight in March, but if they if they're full, you know, and if they just can't, it's, I just have to accept that that I joined a promotion that, you know, already was existing and operating and having fighters contend like before I joined. So, yeah, that makes sense. And you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of the financial side of it, what you want to do is best for you and your family. And you mentioned off the top too, like the differences and being able to get your own sponsors now and just little things along those lines. Yeah. Um, can you, I know it's still early and maybe you have to find out what it's like when you actually book a fight and, you know, you're getting your fight gear organized, but what's your feeling? Like, do you feel like that is a, a significant market and it's going to be able to allow you to make a, a good amount of money? Absolutely. Like I, I think that one of the hardest things for most fighters, you know, and I'm not bashing the UFC. I understand mm. why they did the, what they did for a business decision, but there were so many fighters that were making, you know, comparable or sometimes more from sponsorships than they were off of their fight purse. And so that sponsorship deal with Reebok and then, you know, having with crypto, like at least Reebok and, you know, Venom actually pay the fighters right now they're promoting crypto and the fighters see none of that money, you know? And so I think I was just like, it was really sad for me, you know, it was really sad for me for the fighters because we have to make a living too, you know? And so I think that, uh, other promotions, keeping it the way that they have, it's pro fighters, you know? And so like, it sees where the, the organization, what they care about. Yeah. So would it be fair to say that like, you know, with Bellator, maybe you feel truly like more of an independent contractor, whereas the UFC, you know, they can just, as you say, make a subjective decision here and there. You have to do this. They can raise the pay-per-view prices. We just saw none of that goes to the fighters. And there's just a lot of things that they can uh, just kind of, place over you guys and you have to go along with it in a lot of ways. Yeah. I don't think it's like a big secret that they certainly have like a lot of control over mm -hmm. fighters. Um, and with their, you know, their dominance in some of the markets, like it's like a take it or leave it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's just, you know, like that's sometimes the way the business is. And I think that the, the more promotions that become stronger contenders and the more promotions that offer, really great money, really great exposure, things like that. They just won't be able to do that to fighters anymore because fighters will have other options. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the progressions of the sport. I know it's, you know, it feels it's like a, we're, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. Like free market and competition and stuff like in every other sports team, this is a wonderful thing for the sport. So I'm yeah. glad we're catching up. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure it'll be still a long road ahead, but you know, it's uh, baby steps in that regard in a lot of ways. Um, you mentioned the move up to 45. Um, was that ever something that in your UFC run was like presented to you or a serious consideration of, you know, hey, let's maybe try to do some fights at 45. We know how short the line is there for Amanda. Uh, was that mm -hmm. something that ever really came into play? So for me, it wasn't like it was presented to me as much, but um, for me, I thought about it, like even when I was making 35, just because um, cutting down to 145, it's not that it was, it, it definitely like probably cut into my performance just a little bit more than I would have liked. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like at 145, I feel like I would be fresher, especially in a fight that goes five rounds. That is like, I, I always thought like, okay, I can do well at three rounds, um, cutting this amount of weight and I mean, really like dehydrating, um, I can still do it, but man, I just felt like how much better could I fight 
being really fresh, being on full fuel, being fully hydrated. Like, um, so I had considered it even while in the UFC, but at the time I was looking at it, I was like, well, they don't even have a featherweight division, like on their website. Um, there's no clear path. There's no, you know, like, I feel like maybe if you fight at 145, you're just doing like one-offs, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Whereas at Bantamweight, I think that they invested more into that weight class and they, um, it was more like that and previously uh, straw weight were like the premier weight classes. And so I think it just, featherweight never really seemed to take off. And so it just seemed like a, not an intelligent decision to move up and it be more like obscure, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And there's no doubt about it. Bellator has the most complete and thorough women's featherweight division in the whole sport. And kind of going off that, um, Chris Cyborg, the champion currently, tweeted out her excitement when the news broke that you had signed. Um, she's beaten most of the women in this weight class already, some of them two times over. So I think when they see her signing, it's like, hey, a new opponent for Cyborg. In your mind, though, how quick do you want to get there? Is that something you hope to do immediately? Do you want to get your feet wet in Bellator first? What's kind of the game plan in your mind's eye in a perfect world? I think that I'd like to fight at, at 145 like once or twice before uh, a title fight just to get my bearings and like adjust to like anything that might be a little bit different. I don't think it's going to be that different, but um, I don't want any, I don't want my first fight to be, you know, if there are any surprises, I would rather it not happen in a title fight. <laughs> um, but also, it's really important to me to show that I deserve and earn what I have. And so um, I don't want to come in and just skip the line. I very much believe that I will beat the people in line. So it makes sense to me to build that fight. Yeah. And how much of a motivator like is to get that fight though? I mean, you fought, you know, the Amanda, Rhonda, you fought some of the greatest, you know, women's fighters of all time. Um, is Cyborg like an important fight for you to check off the list to be like, Hey, I fought all the best of my generation, regardless of promotion. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, if you beat her, you are the best feather featherweight, you know, like I, and I know that she, um, her and Amanda fought, you know, but I view that fight as like standing in front of each other and just going blow for blow that could have gone either way. Cyborg stood toe to toe with tons of people gone blow for blow and it worked out her way. So I think that you fight her and Amanda 10 times and five times it's gonna go Cyborg's way, five times it's gonna go Amanda's way. It's not really like a, you know, that she was so dominant. It's, a, it's a kind of a foolish way to fight, but you know, people do. Oh, here's my cat. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, <laughs> we had a nice visitor, that was cute. Um, yeah, and going off that, I mean, I think if it was not going to be uh, Bellator, right, there would have been talk like PFL, Kayla Harrison, that's like maybe one of the exciting things, but she's only got a couple fights left. And I know Bellator already made a significant play to try to get her in the past. And, you know, PFL was able to match the contract, all this kind yeah. of behind the scenes stuff. But I wouldn't be surprised about some point down the line, we do see her come to Bellator because I know she wants that fight with Cyborg and stuff like is that as a former Olympian, I guess, what do you think of Kayla? And is that a fight that maybe you hope materializes at some point down the line too? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I had not really thought about her as much because she was at 155. Mm -hmm. So like with Cyborg being at 145 and sometimes even making 140, I thought, okay, like that's someone I've always kind of had more on the radar, but um, Kayla's judo weight was so much bigger than my weight class. And then her coming down to 55, I just never knew um, if she could make 145. So I hadn't really thought about that, but I think that the deeper that it is, the better, the better it is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And she, she has made weight. I think one fight in Invicta, she did do a 145 fight. So uh, I think it, the door is open to that at some point in the future. Yep. No. Yeah. And so if you want to be the best, you want to beat the best. You don't want to get to the end and be like, Oh, I have this title, but you fought, you know, nobody significant to get there. Cause it just doesn't mean as much. Yep, for sure. And uh, I guess before I let you go, I just have to ask, I mean, I know in Bellator when they released this, I think they said it was a multi-year deal. Uh, but, you know, you are 42 years old. I just recently <laughs> turned in September. I know you take incredible you know, uh, condition of your body and things like that. But do you think about how much longer you want to do this? Like, does this feel going in like the final chapter of your career, even though there's a lot of great things that could happen here? So it's tough because I just never know. And Honestly, when I first started MMA, I was like, I'm going to retire at like 35. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, um, man, I just take it like 
fight to fight year to year, you know, like I just don't project into the future because I don't know, like I, I've trained really smart since I was like, I think 33 or 34, I really started looking into what helps uh, athletes keep longevity. And I very diligently and intelligently taken care of my body. And it seems to like really, really pay off. And so if I start to notice if I'm like, oh my God, I'm going really downhill and we've all seen it. We've seen it with other sports. We've seen it with fighters. If I see that, I'll be like, okay, that's it. Whether you like it or not, that's it. You had a great run. You had longer than most people. It ain't for you anymore, but it keeps not happening. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, I really like, I really like to do this. It's exciting. It's exciting to do this. And I'm like, you know, there is going to come a time where I'll never fight again, but not yet. <laughs> yep. I think that's the right answer. And actually one more before I let you go. So um, you talk about potentially the debut in March. Is there a name that kind of catches your eye? I'm looking at the rankings here right now. Uh, the champion is Cyborg. Number one is Kat Zingano. I think in Bellator's perfect world, they would do that fight next for the belt. And then below yeah. that, there's Arlene Blankow, Sinead Cavanaugh, Leah McCourt, Pam Sorensen, Diana Silva. Do any of those names uh, interest you over the other? So while I know all of those ladies, um, I haven't really studied them. Hmm. So, but I'm, I'm okay. Like, after fighting for so long with like at the, the top of the Bantamweight, it doesn't matter. You put me against any ranking, you can't put me against any fighter. At this point, it would be a shame if I couldn't just step in and fight whoever they put in front of me. So um, I, I don't have anybody that stands out that I'm like, oh, I really think that's a great matchup for me. And that is a great debut. Um, whoever they think is best, I'm I'm down for that. Bring it on. Awesome, yeah, Sarah. let's party. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate the time, Sarah. Congratulations on this news. I was very excited to, you know, see you get this done. And obviously, it seems like this is uh, something that's uh, positive for you in all different areas. So uh, congratulations on that. And hope you've had a good holidays and looking forward to seeing you in there next year. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great day. You too.